Here's a brief description of obscure pusher design aircraft you've probably never heard of. Number one, introducing the aircraft that led the way to Cirrus domination on general aviation, the Cirrus BK-30. Wait, what? The first Cirrus aircraft was a pusher kit plane? In the early 1980s, Wisconsin college students Allen and Dale Klapmeyer and Jeff Feigen sought out to develop the most advanced kit plane in the market. Dale's experience at NASA helped shape the laminar flow wing. Jeff's wife Sally designed the Fowler flaps, and Molt Taylor, father of the aero car, was consulted on the pusher prop configuration chosen for best visibility. Every detail on the aircraft was optimized for low drag and high efficiency, and hence, the first Cirrus was born in a barn that belonged to Klapmeyer's parents in a small town in Wisconsin. It would be known as the VK-30. The speed of development and lower cost, parts were lifted from production aircraft. The nose gear came from a Piper Cherokee and the main landing gear from a Lake LA-4 amphibian. The Cirrus VK-30 was designed as a five-seater, so cabin proportions were big and spacious making it much larger than any other home built from its era. It was introduced at the Oshkosh Air Venture in 1987 and took its first flight in 1988. There was absolutely nothing that matched the VK-30 in size and performance. It could cruise at 215 knots, climb at 1,500 feet per minute, and had a range of 1,300 miles. Cirrus teamed up with an Israeli company to produce a version powered by a Pratt & Whitney PT-6 turboprop and included a cruciform tail surface. Known as the ST-50, this version unfortunately never passed the prototype stage. Although an estimated 40 VK-30 kits were sold, only 13 were completed and flown. A testament to the challenges this aircraft posed for home builders. The VK-30 with its complex curves and mid-mountain engine required a deft hand, and certainly outside the realm of a novice builder. Sadly, many were lost in crashes, and very few remain airworthy. The VK-30 was considered a commercial flop, but the lessons learned from its construction served as the basis for what can be considered the best general aviation aircraft in the last 20 years. In addition, the VK-30 served as the primary inspiration for the Cirrus jet, the first certified single pilot jet with a ballistic system. Number two. Typically, aircraft designed for great pilot and passenger visibility tend to be slow, as is the case with the Edgley Optica. But that's certainly not the case with the Grinvalds Orion. This French kit built design first flew in 1981, and at the time was unique for its bowl configuration four seats, pusher prop, and all glass construction. The Prescott Pusher and Cirrus VK-30 were similar in design, but would take almost another 10 years to fly. And let's face it, the elegant Orion scores a perfect 10 when compared to the stubby Prescott Pusher. A defining feature on the Orion, pilots are surrounded by glass house windows, allowing an almost unobstructed view to the sides. As with many other push designs, the Lycoming IO360 was mounted in the center of the fuselage to maintain its center of gravity and ensure stability. This meant the engine and propeller were distant from one another. As a result, the setup is quite complex and turned out to be the Orion's biggest Achilles heel. The complex drive system consisted of the engine, which is connected to a flexonine plate, sliding sleeve, flexor coupling, steel shaft, and finally the propeller. Presumably, that alone accounted for 50% of the build time and 80% of the headaches experienced by owners. The prototype was powered by a 65 horsepower Continental and could seat two, which I assume was quite underpowered. The production model could carry four passengers and was powered with a 180 horsepower Lycoming IO360. The Orion was a complex aircraft and sold in a kit. Or, you could build an Orion from scratch with a set of plans, which would probably take you a lifetime to build. There was hope the Orion would find success, but this was sadly interrupted by the death of its designer in 1985, following an in-flight breakup after prop shaft failure. Following this unfortunate event, 
most orders were canceled. In spite of this setback, several dozen were eventually built, and a small handful are still flying today, mostly in Europe. One Orion is equipped with a tow pump. Number 3. The Prescott Pusher is one of the most fabled experimental aircraft ever built. It was born in the spotlight and failed spectacularly, also in the spotlight. Loved by a few and hated by most, it's an interesting study in aircraft development. Tom Prescott was an engineer for Sikorsky, Piper, and lastly Learjet. With this impressive curriculum and backed by several investors, Prescott set out to develop a new age kit plane which would be based on CAD CAM software which was groundbreaking in 1985. Boasting precision fit and finish, the Prescott Pusher was developed in record time using computer graphics and launched at Oshkosh to huge fanfare. The Pusher was featured in 10 aviation publications, all hailing the revolutionary design and equally revolutionary modular construction, allowing builders to order and pay for each kit separately. Once those aviation editors took a spin in the pusher, all that enthusiasm evaporated in thin air. Big, short coupled, and draggy, the pusher was also underpowered with only 180 horsepower. Compounding matters, the pusher sat low on the ground and required a short and inefficient prop. The landing gear had to be positioned far aft to avoid prop strikes, and as a result, Pilots would have to force it off the ground with lots of force and easily provoking pilot-induced oscillations. Stall speeds were very high and thus the pusher ate up runways like a champ. One owner with experience flying more than 50 aircraft wrote, This is a demanding aircraft, and if you are a 172 driver, you should try something else. Only three years later, the company folded with all the bad publicity. Yet, during that time, sold a handful of kits. Each owner found themselves in a perpetual modifications loop in order to make the plane somewhat usable. In fact, one owner made over 100 mods to his plane, including an upgrade to 260 horsepower. Even then, they are not practical as they were found unstable with four passengers. Number four, the Angel 44 was designed by Carl Mortensen, a missionary bush pilot. Carl's previous endeavor was the Evangel 4500, a very boxy stolt aircraft. While the Evangel had the elegance of a tin can with square wings attached, the Angel is a bit more sexy and elegant, somewhat resembling a Piaggio Avanti dressed up as a bushman. The Angel features twin pusher Lycoming IO 540s, employing shields around the main wheels to keep dirt and rocks from kicking into the prop. The main fuselage is also long and boxy but all corners are, were rounded off as a clear effort was made to increase cruise speed. The tail is somewhat similar to a Cessna 402's, but twice the size. Offsetting the Angel's elegant lines are three plus sized tires, making it clear what this plane was built for. The wings are swept, but very thick, and with the same large flaps as the Evangel. The IFR certified Angel boasted a 1,920 pound useful load while cruising at a respectful 175 knots. Like the Evangel, the Angel could take a devilish beating, able to withstand loads up to 20 Gs. The Angel 44 went through a long development period with initial design in 1972, first flight in the mid 80s, and FAA certification in the early 90s. The design phase involved more than 11,000 hours of work and over 1,000 drawings. Sadly, as with its predecessor, the Angel never found a market and only four were built. News or updates are scarce. It appears the Angel was bought by a Chinese firm a few years ago, but no further developments in terms of production are known at the present time. Number 5. Now we feature another slick pusher from Germany, the Grobe GF200. Grobe was renowned as a builder of light planes and sailplanes. So the GF200 was a bold and risky step for the company. Grobe conducted a market study and identified an opportunity to replace aging high performance aircraft in the four to six passenger category. The GF200 could seat four, 
and was initially powered by a mid-mountain 270 horsepower Lycoming spinning a composite prop, also requiring a long drive shaft. The design first came out in 1983, but certification stalled as the authorities were uncertain how to certify the composite airframe. Once they gained financial backing from the German government, the Grobe was eventually certified in the early 90s. Grobe envisioned a highly advanced pressurized traveling machine and was originally to be powered by a Porsche motor, allowing it to cruise at 225 knots. As the project was delayed and with skyrocketing costs, Grobe switched to a less exotic Lycoming TIO 540, which was later replaced with a Continental IO 550. As nice as the GF200 looked on the outside, the prototype lacked any real passenger amenities, such as soundproofing, and was used strictly for flight testing. Grobe would require more investments to bring the aircraft to production. At this stage, the GF200 wasn't even pressurized, so it still had a long way to reach its true potential. Unfortunately, funds dried up, and the GF200 found no interested buyers or investors. This turned out to be a very costly exercise for Grobe, who didn't have a penny left to invest in their exotic design. The good news is that the Seoul GF200 is nicely preserved at the Deutsches Museum in Munich for your viewing pleasure.